Ah! Uh, hello, my name is Jeremy, this is Red Means Recording, and today I want to talk to you about sequencing. So sometimes I ask patrons and people on YouTube and friends and my family and my dog ah! uh, what they might like to see a video on, and uh, in this case someone suggested doing a video on sequencing. Sequencing is kind of a broad topic, but I kind of like the idea because there's a lot of really cool types of sequencing, so I thought I would do a video on talking about the different types of sequencing that I'm familiar with, everything from the most basic to really exotic kind of cool stuff, and I'll try to show off some examples on the way. It's gonna be fun, I promise. Let's get started. I got, I got notes here. Throughout all of history, we have had musical instruments and the need to make them make sound in a certain order. And generally, we've been using our fingers for that. But sequencing is like, we're lazy. We don't want to do that. We want computers to do the work, or robots to do the work, or voltages to do the work. So we invented sequencers, and yeah. Let's start off by talking about analog sequencers, and examples of these would be like the Moog 960 or the Korg SQ-1. So these typically are a series of knobs that represent each step, and those knobs can be turned to send out a certain voltage. That voltage will be what determines the pitch when you send that voltage to an oscillator. Sequencers like this, because they're just sending out voltage, can be used to affect other things too, like uh, parameters of a filter or something like that. It all depends on what you're sending the voltage two. So typically you have these knobs and you turn them and hopefully you get some semblance of the pitch that you want. Then you send the sequencer a signal that is basically like a trigger signal that uh, will tell each step to either advance or trigger in some order. So another sort of child of that is like you have a step sequencer that actually has designated pitches in it and each step represents a pitch, uh, a, a slice of time, and you send it a clock source and like with the Zoya, that clock source is going to be a square wave that is going from zero to one. Every single time it passes a certain threshold, it uh, will trigger the next step or a step in the sequencer. You can get really funky with it depending on how and how many voltage sources you're sending to the sequencer itself. The next form of sequencing that I can think of would be uh, numerical editors, and these are mostly found in trackers. And the way that these usually work is that you have multiple tracks and each track you put in a note name. So, you know, C1, G2, E3, you know, like the note name is the note itself. And then you have columns uh, to the right of that that represent different permutations of either the octave or a slew of effects that are available to you through the tracker. These effects are things like bending the note or changing the position that you're playing the sample from or something like that. You can tell each step in this thing through uh, numbers and letters to do all kinds of stuff to that particular note. And the tracker usually runs uh, down a list of these things, um, which I'm showing to you right now. Like I said, Fast Tracker 2 is a really notable example of this type of sequencing. Another example of this would be LSDJ, which is really, really popular within the chiptune tracker scene. Uh, you know, there's a port on it for Game Boy, I believe. And then you have something like Renoise, which is like the most modern, crazy ass tracker I could possibly think of. And you can make really, really advanced music. Everything from, you know, classic, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this. Anything from like classic EDM to incredible like IDM stuff. I have a friend that's made multiple albums using Renoise. Um, I'm gonna flog him here because his music is really, really good. So yeah, that type of sequencing I would call numerical editors. Next up, we have score editors, and these look like you're writing sheet music. Um, these are traditionally used by composers who are, I guess, classically trained composers because they know what note notation should look like. Um, I have only used one once, and that was because somebody asked for a transcription of one of my YouTube library tracks, which was piano-based. I used a program called MuseScore, which I think is free? to uh, import the MIDI and then turn it into uh, sheet music. And it did an okay job. Two other notable examples in this realm are Sibelius and Dorico. Um, and there's lots of videos online about people using these, including at least one from Adam Neely uh, composing in these pieces of software. Next up is the step sequencer. A step sequencer is kind of what, it's, what it sounds like. Um, each unit of time is represented by a step, and you uh, tell that step to perform a certain action, starting with uh, play a note on this step. Um, and then you can do all kinds of stuff to that step too, like um, what note it is, 
Uh, with the case of the electron boxes, you can lock all kinds of parameters to that step. 303s, uh, 808s, these classic old drum machines, and a lot of modern groove boxes all use the step sequencer. Uh, there's a step sequencer on the OP-1. FL Studio started off with just being a step sequencer back in the day. The Deluge, Ableton's Push 2 has a step sequencer. They're a really cool way to interact with uh, drums and monophonic instruments. So you'll see them a lot in that respect. Which leads us to one of the most common modern uh, digital audio workstation types of sequencing I can think of, and that's the piano roll editor. A piano roll is something that takes its name from uh, player pianos back in the day, where you would have this roll of paper and it would have punch holes in it of varying lengths and in various spaces. And those individual uh, things represented notes and duration of notes. And as the mechanism of the piano roll player played through it, it would see these little punches in the paper and play a note for a duration and note type that it told it to. So in modern DAWs, uh, you'll see these all over the place. Um, it's usually uh, left to right in terms of time, and then the vertical axis is for pitch. You can choose a quantized length, which means a length of note that you want each entry on the piano roll to be. Um, generally, if you're recording MIDI into these things, uh, you'll just play and then you can edit it later. Ableton's uh, obviously got a very robust piano roll editor. Reason, FL Studio, Cubase, um, and most modern iOS DAWs all use piano roll editors for this kind of stuff. All right, so now we're gonna start getting into some of the more exotic types of sequencing. Um, and the first one I wanna talk about is Euclidean sequencing. Euclidean rhythms were first sort of keyed upon by Godfrey Toussaint in a paper that I can link in the video description. Um, but basically it's the idea that distributing a certain number of notes over a certain amount of pattern will generate most rhythmic patterns that we experience. So for instance, like four kicks over a 16 step pattern will generate the classic four on the floor beat that you're used to with house and a lot of EDM. But if you change the number of notes to something that's not four and the number of steps to not 16 and start distributing those in interesting ways, you start getting Euclidean rhythms. And uh, I think his argument was that um, these things can be found in a lot of world music. So I'm a little out of my element describing this, so I'm sorry. Hello everybody, in today's video, I'm going to be explaining Euclidean rhythms. The Sonic Potions LXR drum machine had a Euclidean rhythm generator in it, which was really cool. The URAC module grids uh, at its basis is Euclidean rhythm generator. And then um, you'll find a lot of the stuff in iOS. So patterning, which is a really, really cool drum machine, has a basis in Euclidean rhythm generation. And Roosemaker recently introduced a Euclidean rhythm generator into there. So hopefully I've shown some of these on screen and you can get a little sense of what Euclidean rhythm generation looks like. Next up in the sort of more exotic types of sequencing is generative sequencing. Um, generative sequencing is when you feed a sequencer a certain sort of parameter set, and then it starts to generate a constantly evolving set of output based on those rules. Um, so it might change the pitches constantly within a certain constraint. It might uh, generate new rhythms based on a certain set of rules. It might examine itself after each round and then make new rules for the next thing. Generative sequencers are really, really, really cool for ambient and IDM and uh, as beds underneath um, things like techno and stuff like that. You define the parameters of the sequence, but you let this thing take control and make new and interesting things for you. Super, super cool on pitch percussion and on drums, especially glitchy drums, as you might imagine. Some notable examples of generative sequencers are polyphase on iOS. This thing is super, super, super cool. There are a ton of other ones. Just Google generative sequencer VST and you'll find a bunch of other ones. Somewhat related to generative is the cellular automaton type of sequencing. You can find it in like a reactor ensemble called New School and the iOS synthesizer Synthesizer. It uses simulated cellular growth patterns <laughs> to, uh, to create new permutations on the sequence that you fed it based on Conrad's Game of Life, which you probably have seen before. Um, I'm showing you on screen now what it looks like, but basically each node represents a chance for a particular 
permutation of the sequence to either grow or die off. And uh, depending on how you set it up, it can just continually evolve clusters of new permutations on the output, which is super, super, super cool. Next up is Cartesian sequencing, which as you might guess based on the name, is the idea of sort of mapping around a sequence in interesting ways. The Make Noise Rene is the hardware version of this that first comes to mind. It's this beautiful black and gold sequencer thing with touch things in it. When you send it voltage for each um, step of the sequence, it has all these rules that it can follow about how it moves around the sequence. So if you have a grid, basically, and it, you can travel around that grid in really, really interesting ways, and you can evolve how you travel around that grid. Uh, I was lucky enough to find a max for live device called S Snake. MDD snake. I'll put a link for it in the description. But um, as you'll see from what I'm showing you on screen, you have rules about pitch range and um, velocity range and stuff like that and gates. And then you can tell it to travel in different ways around the sequence and constantly evolve through that. Very, very, very cool for um, ambient and um, uh, semi-generative rhythms and stuff like that. Now we're going to get to the final and most sort of like exotic category of sequencers that I personally know of. And these are usually based around sort of the idea of using simulated physics to sequence stuff. The OP1's Tombola sequencer is a really cool example of this, where basically you have a structure, which is a multi-sided polygon. Every time you press a key to trigger a note, a little ball is sent into that structure. And you can choose the gravity of those balls. You can choose to spin the structure. So you get this cascading sort of spinning effect on all of the uh, notes that you've pressed that can constantly sort of surprise you. It's it's not based on any time frame. It's not based on any quantization. Um, and it's really, really cool for ambient stuff. There are some other really, really amazing examples of that, mostly in the iOS and Max for Live and Reactor sort of realm. So Nodal for iOS uh, is one that I recently got that I've been playing with that is like this. I'll be showing you on screen right now and hopefully you can get a sense of what's going on. Another interesting sequencer like this for iOS is called Concentric Rhythm, and it's on screen right now, and uh, I've never used it before. I'm just mentioning it in the video, and then I'll demo it later, because it looked like it belonged in this category. So uh, yeah, hopefully it does. The next two are reactor ensembles that you can get from the reactor library. Um, God bless the reactor library, it's amazing. What do you want? The first one called Spiral, which I'm showing on screen now. I'm petting my dog with my hand. That's why I'm doing this right now. The next one's called Node. So again, these are both reactor ensembles. I'll put a link in the description. You can get them for yourself if you have reactor. Hey, buddy. Oh, goodness. Oh, God. Say hi. So that's been uh, my quick and dirty introduction to sequencing in various forms. Do you have a favorite type of sequencing besides gene sequencing? So you can give yourself pause, you weirdo. Let me know in the comments below. And uh, yeah, I hope this has been informative. My name is Jeremy, that dog is Riker. This is Red Beans Recording, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Why are you back? <laughs> oh God. What do you want? Ah, ah. Ah. Oh yeah, real quick, I just want to mention, I'm not really sure when this video is coming out, so I've either already released it or it's not released yet, but it will be soon. Um, I have a new album called Object Permanence. I'm very excited about it. Uh, it's releasing December 6th everywhere, all the places that you might want it. Check the link in the video description for either a pre-save link on Spotify or links to where it is everywhere. Um, I hope you like it. Bye. Ah. <laughs>